morning, George Wilson. This is going to be talking about uh, performance and specifically about uh, ZFS, uh, the performance of the ZFS out here and some specific improvements that he's made to that.
we then have two different types of ways that we'll look at the ADL tree. The first is the most common type of allocation where we're trying to determine blocks that are close to the previous offset where we made an allocation. So we want to keep things kind of continuous on disk. So if we allocated, you know, our last allocation was at offset 1000, then we want to start at offset 1000 and find the next region that can satisfy the allocation, the allocable size that we're requesting. Um, but that's not always the way that it would work. When a meta slab starts to fill up and you get to the point where you have, um, where you don't have as much free space on that meta slab, we'll switch to actually using the best fit algorithm. This effectively turns all the writes into random writes. It is a big performance cost. So there's a tunable that allows you to determine when, when that switch occurs, but if you've been running systems, you may have encountered that in the past. So when we started going after this, we tried to ask ourselves, what is it that we really want to improve here? Because um, when it comes to you know, performance in DFS, there's various areas to go after. And really what we were after were fragmentation. We knew that no matter what, no matter what system you're running, you're going to hit some fragmentation sometime in that lifetime of that pool. Um, typically it happens as the pool ages. It also happens as you approach you know, higher capacities. So, you know, you're getting to the point where there's going to be a cliff. The question is, how soon are you going to hit it? In some cases, if you have a lot of fragmentation, that cliff may come very early in the life cycle of that pool. Um, hopefully, that's not the case for most people. Um, so internally, one of my colleagues actually developed this, um, this benchmark, which is actually kind of an overkill, or worst case scenario. We call it the frag benchmark. Some of you may have seen there's a blog that you may have put, had posted. It's available out there. If people are interested, let me know. Share the link. But the whole idea behind it is that you create a pool and you fill it to a given capacity. So effectively DE the, the you know a bunch of files, fill it with random data, and then start this spread benchmark, which is going to take random offsets and just overwrite that data. It just sits there and churns as long as you want it to. What we're monitoring for though is we're looking for kind of a steady state, a point where we're no longer seeing a big fluctuation in um, in IOPS or throughput. And once we get to that state, we'll, at, at that point in time, we'll take a sample and then average out that, the IOPS over that sample and then report that as a quote unquote IOPS, random right, right IOPS for that frag benchmark at that, that capacity. Um, we focused our investigation on pool capacities less than 80%. Um, we found that 80% is a good benchmark for where there is typically a cliff in performance. So we wanted to make sure that for anything less than 80%, that's what we would target. But we also didn't want to kill performance above and beyond that. So, so let's look back. Uh, those that were here last year kind of heard me talk a little bit about some of the improvements we've made in this area. So I'm not going to go into a lot of details, but I'll just mention them. Um, so if we look at the three phases of allocation, we've been targeting um, work in each of these three phases, in, in these, each of these three areas. So we, we in, introduced this ZFS MG allowed threshold, which is a manual tunable, that forces or allows an administrator to set it so that it forces you to allocate from devices that have a lot of free space versus devices that might be mostly full. Again, targeting, that's targeting cases where you may have an imbalance pool. You may have added some new disks, and so now you have devices that are full and some that are empty, and you want to get the performance back to a normal, to a normal level. We also introduced improved Metaslab preload. Um, again, the, the idea there is we want to make sure that these Metaslabs that have the free space are actually loaded in core before you actually get to the allocation code pass so that you don't take a hit when you're actually trying to look for a free block. We introduced a space map histogram. This was an omnibus change. This is a feature flag. Um, I don't know if, I, I think Linux doesn't have it yet. Correct? Does FreeBSD, has FreeBSD actually pulled out? Yeah, FreeBSD is good. So we started off kind of as a, on a, on a quest to actually get more information. And that's the whole idea with, with regards to introducing this early. What it starts to store on this is how is that free space comprised? So instead of just simply saying, yes, I have, you know, a gig of free space. Now we can take that gig of free space and break it up into power of two buckets to tell us how is it actually laid out on the disk. Is it primarily 100 meg, you know, 
or a mix sediment, or is it 128 case sediments that primarily make up that one data space? You want to use that and put it out there early so that we can get data back to try to start making some smart decisions on how we actually output. And from that, the fragmentation metric is born, which was the next step in our, in our quest here. Um, this allowed us to actually take all that histogram information and build it up into a single number that we call our fragmentation metric. It's a little nebulous to kind of try to, to take all this information and, and roll it up into one number and give meaning to, to it. So I'll describe a little bit about it because I'm sure that people that have seen it are wondering, what the heck does that mean? Um, and then we also played around with it, the actual block allocator trying to come up with one that was a little bit more suitable. So how do we define fragmentation? This was our first attempt at trying to roll all of this information that we were getting from the space map histograms into a fragmentation value. So the idea here is that we kind of created this table where if you had segments that were 16 meg or larger, then you effectively said that space was not fragmented. Zero fragmentation was actually given to that, that range of, of segments. Um, and that was based on some empirical data that we had seen where if you had 16 meg segments around, you typically didn't take performance hit at all when you were doing allocations. If you had segments that were 1K or smaller, then you would deem those as 100%. Fragmented. And then there's kind of a range in between where 50% means that your space is primarily comprised of 128k segments. So this is actually taken off of ZDB output for one of the pools. Um, and I've given kind of the breakdown of the table there in red that you see on the left side. Um, but we can clearly see that this, this mess up to here says fragmentation is 80%, which is telling us that most of the space is actually 16k or larger. So then, let's do a comparison of the changes we made last year and what did they actually do to performance when in, in respect to the fragmented model. So the blue line that we actually see here is the baseline number. This is before we actually introduced any change. When we had introduced the uh, Metaslab, or the fragmentation metric and the space map histogram, what we saw was this increase in random write IOPS between the 60 to 80 percent range. And I've, I've discounted everything below 60 percent because those numbers tend to be pretty good. So again, we were focused on everything less than 80 percent. Um, but we see some pretty significant improvements. When you look at a 60 percent capacity, we're seeing almost 70 percent improvements on random write-off IOPS. But the thing that alarms us here is this steep in, uh, decline. And we can actually see that when we get beyond 90 and we're looking at 95 percent, we're actually below the baseline number. So we wanted to go off and figure out, could we do more? So where is it that we're actually going now with our current changes? Again, we're, we're focusing on the three areas of allocation. So the first is we're looking at this new thing that we're referring to as allocation throttle. The idea behind the allocation throttle is that you limit how much data you send to a given device if, in fact, it can't do the work fast enough. So you, you give every device, you know, some bit of work to do. The ones that complete quickly, more than likely, are less fragmented or less full, can do more work, give them more work to do. The ones that are more full or highly fragmented will take longer to churn through that work. They'll get less of the overall workload. But in the end, you're keeping all the devices 100% busy. We also did a change in the way that we do weighting. We refer that to the dynamic metaslab selection. This is going to help us make better decisions when we're selecting the metaslab. And then the last piece is a project we refer to as whole filling. I'll go into more detail on what that would call that. So let's talk a little bit about dynamic metaslab selection. Um, so again, the idea here is to change the weight of the metaslab based on information that we now have. This all stems from the foundation of the space map histogram that we started a year ago. If we have that new information, we can now make better decisions 
And one of the things that we were able to determine is that we can now encode the largest segment into the weight value itself. In the past, all we had was free space. That's all we knew about. But now, we can simply look at the histogram bucket, figure out what is the index of the largest segment, and encode that directly into the weight, giving the weight a higher value. So now, the larger, the, the bigger the contiguous segment is on a metaslab, the higher the weighting for that individual metaslab, the more likely it's going to get selected, and that's the one that we're going to go off and try to find and rewalk. With that in mind, we had to actually change slightly the way that we represented the weights in the past. So we now introduce two weighting mechanisms. One we refer to as space-based weighting, which is the old style. The difference being here is we've taken one bit which is the 62nd bit, um, which is always one to indicate that, in fact, it is always space-based. And all it knows about is weights, or sorry, free space. So it's the free space, old way, but we've taken one bit away from it. In the new weighting, the second base weighting, we introduce a, higher, a set of higher order bits that indicate the index for the highest bucket of free contiguous space. And then the rest of the bits are just used to indicate how many segments of that size are available. So now you can actually make a comparison. If you had a metaslab with the largest segment being 1 meg and a metaslab that's largest segment is 16K, even though the metaslab with 16K may have gigs worth of free space, we're going to select the metaslab that has 1 meg of free space to go in and do our applications. So what does that look like when we actually put this all together? Um, the green line now represents the uh, new algorithm. And what we see is when we compare that with the baseline and also the previous runs from the um, past, we see that the line has actually started, has started to flatten out. When we're looking at 80%, instead of having a huge clip down below, we're actually seeing a 73% improvement over last year's number, which was already an improvement so from this, we have, we have good data that tells us that even though this benchmark frag is kind of a worst case scenario, we have a reason to believe that these improvements are going to make a overall general improvement regardless of the workload. It's even more interesting when we actually start looking at fragmentation and the fragmentation value. This again is that one number or metric that we give to the pool. The numbers that we represent here in the yellow actually are the numbers from last year's improvements. Because we didn't have fragmentation metric before that, so we couldn't do that comparison. The red line is showing us the current benchmark numbers with the, improved, um, with the improvements that we're proposing today. And the blue shows fragmentation of what the pool is running these bits. So even though we're getting better performance across the board, we've reduced fragmentation in the pool completely. So in the 60% level, we're talking now fragmentation that's in the 70 range, like 70, I think it's like 77%, compared to like 85%. And you can quickly see that as we approach the 95% range, 95% capacity, we have this huge drop off of performance. And a, a nice correlation here is that fragmentation for both metrics are about the same. We start approaching 90% fragmentation, performance goes to the floor. We can actually go further though. And actually, if we know that fragmentation is such a killer for performance, this is where hole filling can actually come into play. So the idea behind hole filling is to actually look at Metaslabs that have a lot of segments, small segments, and go and actually and allocate directly from those. So if you have a time where the system is mostly idle, or maybe not generating a lot of heavy bright work in it, we can take those periods to go and fill holes, reducing fragmentation, and not, act, and not allocating from pristine areas where we want to keep like large contiguous regions around. So this is running, comparing the two new algorithms, one with hole filling turned on and one with hole filling turned off. And we can see that when you're at 60% capacity, even though we've made an improvement already on fragmentation using the new, the new uh, benchmark, or sorry, the, the new bits, hole filling reduces that significantly. 
And it's not until we reach 95% that, again, the two actually start approaching, the fragmentation number starts approaching the same value. So what's next on this? And where do we go from here? Um, we definitely want to look more at the allocation flow. Uh, we think that there's more room to actually make some enhancements there. That code is mostly complete, but we, we have some things that we want to tweak. Um, we want to specifically look at directed device selection. So I mentioned early on that the way that we actually select devices is we do a round robin type of fashion. But with the allocation throttle, we think that we can actually go specifically and target uh, a device and say, do allocations only on this type of device. If you can't, then throttle that. And we also want to start looking at synchronous rate performance. All these improvements that we talked about here are they're, they're all done in the allocation code path, which handles both synchronous and async paths. But we think that there are areas for improvements that are specific to the synchronous code path that will, that will help us overall when you're running different benchmarks, not necessarily for that. So questions? Yes. Yeah, uh, so the whole thing on the experiment that I know is okay. So what happens when you look at the loop performance? Let's say the system was idle, but now you think the car would say, uh, I know a couple of uh, megabytes inside, and it's been thrown out all over the desktop. So now that when you read back, uh, even by the spot, even if it's a uh, high key protocols, it might be very slow. Yeah, so it's, it's very possible that because we've been also and now your reads become all random reads. Because we've been scattering them all over the place. Um, that's definitely a trade off that we have to consider um, when we're doing this type of thing. But the reality is, at least for many workloads, your files, which are at one point in time contiguous on disk, as they get overwritten, eventually end up being somewhat random. Fulfilling is just making that maybe happen more, happen much earlier than it would normally. Um, but at this point in time, really the only thing that we could count on would be. Um, Leverage prefetching and making sure that data gets cached. That's how we would. That's how we have to deal with it. Yes. Uh, it's big, yeah. <laughs> um, has there been any discussions about how close to solve the fragmentation issue? Whether or not you can use those techniques and algorithms in the future? Um, I'm not familiar with how Postgres solves the fragmentation issue, so I'm going to say the answer is no. There hasn't been any discussion. <laughs> right. I'm open to it. The short answer is.
that one, yeah. Uh, was there a specific type of workload that you applied to this to generate these numbers? So this this workload is running the same fragmentation benchmark, which is just doing random writes over and over for a steady state. Okay, um, so it's not like heavy and then it's, it's not heavy, it's it's kind of it's it, it in it itself because of this machine that we were running on. Yeah. Has a period where there are lower writes than others, um, where it's having to go do some reads and in this case, it was actually reading that data, so we're seeing periods where there's high write workload and low workload, so it's kind of worked out nicely. Okay. Cool. Yeah, it ended up that way. It didn't need to be done. Because one of the areas that we actually want to go back and investigate a little further is, um, hopefully it does, have, does come with a performance implication. We want to make sure that that performance implication is not huge. Yeah. So there's more investigation to be here as well, but it turned out that it Showed us, it showed us some very interesting data as we did, as we gathered it from the fragmentation benchmark. And Alex has done a bunch of other uh, data collection on it as well, doing, doing exactly what you were saying, suggesting, which is like a workload that has a high period of uh, right workload and a low period. Yes? I have a question. Uh, if I understand correctly, it seems that. Uh, the, the biggest influence of uh, applying the real algorithm is actually when the set of drives is full between 6 and 80 percent. Uh, we know well that rotating drives actually lose their performance because of linear write uh, speed as we fill them and the progression is about 20 percent loss of uh, performance every 60 wouldn't it make sense to look actually into reversing the, the sequence with which we use the drive? So I would say if we force ZFS to write at the slowest end of the drive at the very beginning, this would have maybe greater uh, impact on performance than dealing with the algorithms here because we look up. So our latest 40% would be the, so, the, the fastest of the disk on the slowest. So effectively, when we have lots of free space, use the slowest portion of the device, and then as we start to fill the pool, use the fastest yes. portion. Yes, this would be... Then be a very interesting yeah. experiment, especially... If, so in this case, this, this isn't yeah, yeah, just three fast drives. Right. It's very different when you put it on flash, but... Um, or, you know, yeah, it, or, yeah, it would not come on flash but, at all. But it would be a very interesting exercise to do that. And, and actually, within this code, it's, it's very simple to like, weight it such that inner regions actually have a higher weighting and, and get allocated to the So, interesting yeah, I would expect that to have like two and a half times better performance after you can On this. Yes. <laughs> uh, we have, we actually have a typical, which we 
it's not a straight line, just for okay. so we have a tool that actually loaded that. We we've had internal discussions um, on several fronts there. One is make Metaslabs size based versus you know number based, uh, and then tweak them down um, and talk about it. Um, yeah, um, they've also been playing around with it. There's a lot of interesting work uh, in that space. So if you have a system that's always kind of at the end of being out of space, um, if it's doing light work, right workload, then all it's going to be doing is just simply going and finding the right segment. And instead of having to, um, like today, what would normally happen is you load it into the best metal class and consume up, you know, maybe a good portion of it. Um, and a lot of times, if those, if, if you're constantly writing to it and then deleting those files back, you're not really improving the situation where hopefully it could, would actually improve fragmentation because you go and just fill those holes and leave the areas that are of large contiguous free space for something of a better name. But once you start getting that, that point where the pool is very, very near capacity, um, it's, it's tough to get out of it. It's tough to, to clean it up uh, to the point where the fragmentation goes way down. And I don't think, did we ever run the experiment where we actually had a pool that was very full? And then, oh yeah, the fourth hole was actually in the back. Right, the fourth factor. How how far did it go down from the point? Oh, oh, so it goes down that far. So okay. Yes. 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 It's based on how much workload you're, how much right workload you're driving in the system, and you can actually tune that. So I think by default it's 60%. If it stops at 30. Are you sure? Oh, I thought 60 was the It's not like it's yeah. it just like in the background you don't put holes. It's like you're writing and we're just shooting where we allocate that. So, so it's all dynamically done. Based on how much load there is in the system, so if you're not as rigid data, it's less than. So it's the dirty gate that's actually coming in, which we now do other changes and know that before we actually do 